Okay, go ahead. Well, good morning, sanctuary people. Welcome to the new normal, whatever that is. It's going to be evolving, I think. So, I don't know about you, but I'm feeling a little weird about this. Um, I'm not sure how to do corporate worship when you're not all together in the same building. Uh, or when you all are in your homes, and a few of us are here in the in the sanctuary church, but uh, we'll uh, we'll work through this together. We'll learn together how to do this. But I, and I think it's it's important to do. Obviously, we're scaling things back. It's it's just me and the guitar, and uh, we're going to cut back on the number of songs. Um, but uh, we're going to add some other things and, and see what works. Let, let me know what you think works, what doesn't work. Um, I hope you'll feel comfortable sitting at home, singing along with the music. If not, just listen, just meditate, just reflect, and, and let the Lord speak to you. Uh, I want Daryl to share a word from Psalm 27 to get us started as we were thinking about the Lord being our light in these, uh, these troubled times. Psalm 27, beginning in verse 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evil men advance against me to devour my flesh, when my enemies and my foes attack me, they will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then will I be confident. One thing I ask Lord, this is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. For the days of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his tabernacle and set me high upon a rock. And verses 13 and 14, I am still confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord, be strong, and take heart, and wait for the Lord. Amen, thank you. So let's, let's sing, let's worship the God who is our light and our salvation. I will stay in my house, in my I love you, Lord. 
So I was thinking of scriptures that speak to this next song we're going to do. And uh, one that came to mind is out of the book of Habakkuk. You really got to be looking for that book. You're not just going to stumble upon it. It's, it's one of those tiny little three-chapter book in the Minor Prophets. And in it, uh, the people of, of, of Judah are in a, in, in a tough spot. They're in a, they're in a, a nasty situation where they're uh, in danger from foreign enemies. And internally, there's a lot of strife going on. People are not living the way they're supposed to be living. And uh, in this short book, Habakkuk brings a complaint actually a couple of complaints to God, asking him, God, why is this going on? Why are things the way they are? And each time God answers him, and in the end, Habakkuk responds back to God with an expression of, of praise and, and thanks. And um, you might take a look at that little book. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a good read for the kind of things we're going through. But I, I, I'm going to, Daryl, read a few verses that are at the very, the very ending of the book that, again, uh, speak of Habakkuk's response to God as to uh, what it means for a person of faith in troubling times. Habakkuk 3, beginning at verse 17. Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, though the, all the crops fails, and the field produces no food, and there are no sheep in the pen, and no cattle in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. The Sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet the feet of a deer. He enables me to go on the heights. Blessed be your name, the land that is plentiful. Where the streams of abundance flow, blessed be your name. Blessed be your name, I found in the desert place, I walk through the wilderness, blessed be your name. Yes, sir. 
and you can possibly pick some things up for them, come on over to the church, 12 to 1 today. We're going to try and do this every Sunday after service we can. Try. Try to. We'll let you know each week if it's going on. But for today, 12 to 1, right here where we're at. Please come out, pick some stuff up. We are going to limit how you come in. So you have to be patient. We're going to allow so many people in the building's time. This is all about the distancing thing. We want to try and honor that and respect our leaders in the land, too, as long as we respect God above. He placed those people over us for a reason. So with that, I'm going to turn it over. Was that for you? Okay. Oh, yeah. Please bring your own shopping bags. Also, we only have a limited number here. We're going to run out quickly. So please remember your shopping bags if you're coming. And with that, I will turn this over to Brian. I'm excited to see the kind of the first half or the second half we watched earlier with the class. So you'll get it in order later. Love you guys. See you soon. <laughs> Good insert video. All right. Well, so cute. <laughs> the honor of the video. <laughs> there we go. Yes, and Jesus saw himself as continuing that story. 
So he agreed with the law and the prophets when he taught that it's out of the human heart that come the most ugly parts of human nature. It's like the default setting of our hearts is opposed to God's law. But Jesus also said that he came to solve that problem, and in his words, to fulfill the law. So what does he mean there, to fulfill the law? Well, first he said that the demand of all of the laws in the Torah could be fulfilled by what he called the great command, that we are to love God and to love others. So that seems pretty easy. I mean, we all want to love. Well, we think we want to love. But Jesus showed how love is far more demanding than we realize. So he quotes the law, do not murder. And he says, yeah, it's not killing someone, it's a very loving thing to do. But then he also says that when you treat someone with disrespect, when you nurse resentment against them, you're also violating God's moral ideal because you're not treating that person with love. And so Jesus said true love ought to extend even to our own enemies. So even though this command seems very simple, Jesus showed how our hearts are not currently equipped to fulfill even this basic command of God to love others. And that's kind of a damn. But where Israel failed, Jesus brought the story to its fulfillment. As Israel's Messiah, he fully loved God and others, and he showed all the nations what God is truly like. He did this through his acts of compassion and mercy, and ultimately by loving his enemies even unto death. And after his resurrection, he told his followers that he would send God's Spirit to transform their hearts so that they could follow him and fulfill the purpose of the law, to love God and to love their neighbor. So this fulfills the story of the law and the prophets, or in the words of the Apostle Paul, the one who loves fulfills the law. Some of it's poetry and worship songs, that kind of thing. All of that 
is Torah. And sometimes the word Torah is even used to refer to the whole Old Testament, which was the Hebrew Bible that Jesus and Paul read and learned from. So the word Torah is somewhat flexible, and in every case, it basically means instruction, not what we think of as law. So I actually think law is a bad translation. Um, and as the slide is saying here, we're supposed to look at the Bible as a whole, but especially the Pentateuch, the first five books in our Bible, as a story, a narrative. That's, first of all, what it is. Not primarily a list of commands to obey. They're in there, but they're in there as part of the story. So in order to really understand God's message to us, you've got to pay attention to the story, not just the individual commands. If you take the individual commands out of their context, they might be helpful. I mean, it's a good idea to know not to murder people and not to sleep with people you're not married to and things like that. Um, those are great ideas and you can learn from those, but to get their full impact and their meaning for us, you have to understand them in their context of the story. Um, and the story uh, goes as was described in the video you just saw. Humanity blew it, first 11 chapters of Genesis. Genesis 12, God starts a plan to uh, fix the problem. This is his solution to our rebellion. And he starts by choosing a family, a man named Abraham and his wife Sarah, and he said, through you and your family, your millions of descendants, billions, maybe eventually billions, um, I'm gonna reach out to the whole world through you, I'm gonna bless everybody. This is my solution. And we know that part of the key to that solution was a descendant of Abraham named Jesus, who died for us. And that's jumping ahead. In that story, the commands are illustrations that show God's character and heart and will. And they're not the whole Torah that was given to Israel. There was much more that they were given. And we need to understand, next slide, that Yahweh's Torah, Yahweh's instruction, and Yahweh is the personal name of God that he's revealed to us. It means I am or I will be. And out of all the ancient Near East cultures, and there were dozens, they were very similar. They were kind of in dialogue with each other. They influenced each other culturally. They had law codes. But when Yahweh introduced his Torah, it was revolutionary. It was, it, changed the world everywhere it touched. For example, the way that was commonly, the people, individuals were commonly treated was horrible. Um, in most ancient Near East cultures, especially in Assyria, which was the world power for thousands of years at the beginning of Bible times, uh, people, for the most part, most people were treated as their <laughs> as slaves, as property. Uh, the Babylonian creation myth, let me explain that for just a minute, to illustrate how most of the world thought about most people. Uh, the kings wanted everybody to serve them and be their slaves. Well, out of this culture came this creation myth from their supposed origins, and there were different levels of gods, and there weren't any people then. There were the lower gods and the upper gods, and the lower gods were the ones who did all the work and, and you know, raised the, the food for the, the higher gods to eat, uh, gods eat food, um, in those cultures and thinking. And the lower gods were getting tired of this. And they said to the, the higher gods, we don't want to work for you, let's figure out another way to get the work done. And so they worked out a plan where the lower gods killed one of their own, slit his throat, poured out his blood on the ground, mixed it with the, the dirt. And a God's blood mixed with dirt was how they made people. And the purpose of all of humanity was to be slaves, to work for the gods. Okay, that's how the kings perpetrated this creation myth to explain that all people except the king. See, the king, he's really close to God. In fact, in some cases, 
He was God. Uh, but at least he was the image of God here on earth, representing God. And so everybody treated him. Everybody served him. And you can see why those kings would want this, this origin story to be believed. So that everybody would just buy into, hey, you're here for me. Because uh, I'm just representing the gods. So, you know, you're serving them when you serve me. That is how most of the ancient Near East thought about people. You're here to serve. You're here to be treated as property. Yahweh introduced a new creation story that we believe is true. That God created all humans to be his images, co-ruling with God here on earth. And that every individual has equal dignity, as royalty, as, as those given life by a father who's God and treated as, as co co-rulers with him. That was revolutionary. That everybody, every individual, had that kind of relationship with God, not just one person, the king. So you can see at the very beginning, at the outset of Genesis, God was giving us a new perspective that was meant to change the way, and today, in Western culture, where out of 195 countries, I looked this up, 195 countries in existence today, two-thirds of those at least pay lip service to the idea of democracy and hold it up as an ideal. And 50, 57% of today's countries are democracies, even though many are faulty in that, including the United States. But think about that. How different is today's world than it was 3,000 years ago because Yahweh introduced his true story of our origins and his intention for this world. So the Torah that was given to Israel and through them to us changed the world. We are where we are today because God introduced those ideas 3,000 years ago. If he hadn't, very likely we'd still be like that. And some parts of the world still are, but not like it was. Um, just another example or two, um, the Torah really looked out for the weak, the vulnerable, the underprivileged. There are very specific and often repeated commands for Israel to take special care of orphans, those left without a parent in a cruel world, widows, those left without a protector and provider, uh, immigrants in a strange land, maybe forced out of their land by war or ostracism or famine or something. Um, the vulnerable were meant to be cared for. This was revolutionary. So if you look back at the Old Testament commands and you think, how barbaric, you need to change that perspective by understanding what Yahweh introduced at that time. He met that culture where it was and he took them the next step. Now, next thing we need to understand is that Torah isn't law as we think of it today. And here's, we're going to get just a little technical for a minute. Today we live in a culture that, that is guided by what we call statutory law, statutes that are written down. When in our culture we want to find out uh, the right decision, what's right and wrong in a given instance, in court, or just in law enforcement, the authority we go to is a written law code. That's the authority. We're run by the rule of law. And I'm not saying that's bad. The thing we need to be careful of is that we don't take that idea that we're so accustomed to and read it into Torah in the Bible. That wasn't the same there. Instead, actually, the, the idea of statutory law and living by that, where the law code is the authority, the written code, that's only a couple hundred years old. Through almost all of history, in most of the world, there was a different way of thinking about uh, guidance and law. And that might be called common or custom law. The next slide says that in statutory law, a written law code was the authority, but under custom or, or common law, 
Next slide, please. The uh, authority, back up one, please. The authority is a person. A king, usually. That's the authority. And when laws or commands are written down, those are not the final word. Those are examples illustrating what the king wanted, what the, the king thought was wise, what the king's will was. The written codes were just illustrations and examples, not the final authority. To get the final word, you needed to try to understand what the king was thinking. Now, if he was there and you could talk to him, you could ask him, who is our king? In the kingdom of Yahweh, the king is Yahweh, God himself, I am. And he has given us his whole written word, including some example commands to help us understand clues and illustrations and examples of the wisdom of God, the principles that are timeless behind the commands. So for example, when, um, when the Torah commands, uh, I'm trying to think of a good example. <laughs> well, the law's about slavery, let's say. You know, how slaves are being, to be treated. We think, why in the world should there be even laws governing slavery? Slavery shouldn't exist. And you're right, and God thought so too. That was the timeless wisdom principle is that humans should be treated with such dignity and respect and, and value that none could be treated or thought of as property of another, uh, another human. That was God's ideal. Now, in that time and day, God met the people where they were. There was going to be slavery, and so he said, okay, that's not my ideal, but let me take you the next step. Let me show you how to handle slavery better than you're doing. And under the Torah, unheard of things were commanded. For example, every seven years, slaves or servants were to be set free. It wasn't a lifetime thing like was true in most cultures. In most cultures, and even some today, people are born into slavery and expect to live their whole lives in slavery. Even today, in some cultures but all, all over the place back then. Yahweh said no. Every individual has that dignity. And he introduced a command that wasn't, it, it was a clue, it was an illustration of his principle, his wisdom principle applied in that setting. What we need to do is to try to understand Yahweh's will. Next slide, please. Over and over in the Bible, we're told to listen to and obey our God, I am. Now, the reason I put those words together is they're actually from the same Hebrew word, Shema. You might have heard of that. It's the beginning of a, the, the most, uh, most often recited prayer of the Jews and today and has been through the centuries. The Shema it means listen. But it also means obey. It's the same word. So in your English Bibles in the Old Testament, when you see listen or obey, most often it's from that exact same word. In their minds, in their thinking, in their language, those two were tied directly together, okay? And the way it's translated one way or the other in our English Bibles just all depends on context, but keep in mind, when you say obey in the Old Testament, it probably also means listen. When you say listen, it probably also means obey. So, the way we live according to our design by our Creator, and find greatest fulfillment, and in times like this, greatest comfort, is to listen to and obey Yahweh. Now, next slide, please. We're also, that's tied together with love. Over and over, we see statements like, uh, you are to love Yahweh, your God, and obey his commands, and on and on. And the two are considered the same thing. Listening and obeying and loving God were the same thing. Now, never from the start was obedience a means to eternal life and acceptance by God. Now, a right relationship was the way into God's blood, presence, and pleasure. A right relationship. But when you're in right relationship with God, you're loving Him, you're going to obey Him. That's the assumption. And that's the way we're designed. 
love, genuine love, genuine relationship flows out into willing, grateful obedience. Obedience does not save us. Love from God and return to God in faith is the way to salvation. And when we have that relationship, it flows out in obedience. That's why these are tied together. So keep that in mind for a second. Let's go to the next slide. Remember, under the way law was treated through most of history in most places, it's the king who's the authority, and we want to know his wisdom and his will. And written laws are just there to illustrate his wisdom and will. Next slide. So, we listen to, obey, and love Yahweh. The best way to live, the most fulfilling way to live, by, next slide, first of all, prayerfully meditating on his commands. The samples that he has had written in his Torah, we look at those. We understand them. We look at the very words. Try to understand how the, the commands are written. And we meditate on them, we talk with each other. Um, we look at commentaries to understand the significance of the words and ideas in that culture that we're not familiar with. We listen to teachers that know about that. We try to understand them as they were meant then. And a good way, not just to, don't just plan on meditating individually on these, have a party, have some friends over who also are interested in loving and obeying that way. And take some time, sit down and look at a few commands and say, what's the wisdom of Yahweh behind these commands? What's the timeless principle? And that's the next step. From that, we discern the timeless wisdom principles behind those commands. And then third step, once we understand those principles, then we go to work applying them in our lives today, in our new setting, in new ways. So we don't have legalized slavery here in the United States, but we have lots of opportunities of recognizing dignity in, human, in, in every human individual. Rich or poor, man or woman, uh, every color of skin, uh, every uh, uh, education level, you name it, every individual, disabled, healthy body, every individual has equal dignity. And there are hundreds of ways that we need to learn to apply that principle that was introduced to us in the commands about limiting slavery in the Old Testament times. So, let me catch up here. If we want to understand how to do so you're asking, okay, I get the idea, the commands are there as examples that illustrate timeless wisdom principles that we learn and apply today. Great. How do you do that? It happens that we have a lesson on that very topic from Jesus in Matthew 5. Uh, it's part of the first chapter of three chapters in the Sermon on the Mount. And in this, um, Jesus gave us six examples. He quoted from the Torah, or paraphrased it in some cases, and he, he went into this formula six times and said, you've heard it said, and then he said, but I say. So here's the first example he gave. It's one of the Ten Commandments, the sixth of the Ten Commandments. You've heard it said uh, to the people long ago, do not murder. Now I'm just going to go ahead and skip ahead. Uh, we're going to fly through here if you, if you just hit some highlights. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Now it's just not all anger. It's, it's damaging anger. There's a place for righteous anger. God has it. Sometimes we have it. It's how we express it. And he's saying damaging expression of anger or damaging uh, harboring of anger that causes you to fume and fester and become hateful. That's the same. It, it, it's violating that command or the wisdom principle behind the command not to murder. Again, anyone who says uh, harmful things, you know, your rocket means empty head and so on. Um, those are violating the same commands. Anything that intentionally harms another person is violating the wisdom principle behind the sixth commandment, don't murder. There's an example. Jesus gives us a lesson right there. Another one, the next slide is, you've heard it was said, don't commit adultery. Seventh command. But there's a wisdom principle broader than that behind it. Jesus illustrated it and said, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman or a man lustfully <clears throat> has already committed adultery with her or him in his heart. Um, so Jesus said, and keep in mind, got a buzz. Yeah, we turned you up. So okay. And uh, 
uh, it might have to do with the volume of my voice. Anyway, um, he's saying it's not just sleeping with a man or woman you're not married to. And that's one example of the wisdom principle I'm talking about here. He said it's any way that in your mind even you treat or think of another human as a commodity to satisfy your pleasure or meet your desires. Anything along that line is violating the wisdom principle behind this command. So that's an example. Jesus is giving us a lesson, and there's four more examples we won't take time for. I really encourage you to look at the Sermon on the Mount, starting in Matthew 5 through 7. Jesus does an amazingly genius job of explaining what he actually meant. Remember, he is Yahweh. He claimed it. So he was the one back there giving the commands, giving the Torah. So he was really saying, this is what I meant in the first place. This is how the Torah was always meant to be applied to our lives and understood. Paul gives us another example. Let's uh, go to 1 Corinthians 9, 6. He is in an argument with some people via letter, and uh, they're criticizing him uh, for saying that uh, church leaders should be paid you know, for the work they do. He says, is it only I and Barnabas, his friend, who must work for a living? Paul made his own living. He went everywhere. He earned his own money, paid for his own way, and then ministered in his extra time. He said, uh, that's not, I'm, I'm doing it as a gift to people, but it's not the way it should be. Verse 7, who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard and doesn't eat of its grapes? Who tends a flock and doesn't drink of the milk? He, the principle is, um, and somebody who works on something should expect to benefit from the, pro the product of that work. Do I say this merely from a human view? Am I just reasoning this out? No, God said so. Doesn't the Torah say the same thing? For it is written in the Torah of Moses, don't muzzle an ox while it's treading out the grain. So the ox is, you know, walking around in this circle on this grain, getting the holes broken off by stomping on it getting the grain out so they could separate it. And the custom often was to put a muzzle on so the ox wouldn't eat the grain that people wanted. And God said in the original Torah, you want to be kind to animals. They uh, should be treated in a way where they get some of the benefit of their work. That's true. But there's more behind it. Paul said, is it about oxen that God is concerned? No, people too. Next slide. Surely he says this for us because when the plowman plows and the thresher threshes, they ought to do so in the hope of sharing in the harvest. If we, church leaders, have sown spiritual seed among you, is it too much if we reap a material harvest from you? So we, all of this is an argument to help the, the people at Corinth understand that those who are working hard for their spiritual benefit, which is critically important, should be receive uh, a payment for that hard work. But he got all that from an a command in the Torah about treating ox the same way. <laughs> so Paul gives a list in how to read Torah. Now, I want to go back to Matthew 5. Uh, no, actually, uh, first we're going to look at Matthew 22, and this was mentioned in the video. Um, this is one of the filters that we should apply when we're doing this exercise, when we individually meditate, try to find those wisdom principles and then figure out how to apply them to our lives, or as we talk with others and figure out those principles, what if we come up with some wrong principles? Well, one of the filters that guides us is Jesus' great command, love God with everything and love people like you love yourself. Treat other people as well as you treat yourself, or better. That's one of the filters. Ask yourself, are these principles that we're discerning and coming up with and trying to apply in our lives, are they loving to God and to people? And keep in mind, biblical love doesn't just mean everybody feels good about each other. It means we act in the best interest of the other. And sometimes that doesn't feel good. It's the one doing the loving or the one being loved. Parents know that. <laughs> Law enforcement officers know that when they pull somebody over for their own benefit and safety and for the safety of others. It doesn't mean everybody feels good about each other all the time. Sometimes, yes. 
it means you act in the best interest. So let that be one of the filters to see are the principles we're coming up, the wisdom we're discerning from Yahweh, the king, and wanting to live in our lives as his kingdom citizens, are they loving to him and to people? Now I'm going to go back to Matthew 5 and the portion before those six examples in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus led up to those six examples by saying, don't think that I've come to abolish the Torah of the prophets. See, his teaching was so radical compared to what had been taught in Israel in that day that people were thinking, oh man, he's doing away with the, the Old Testament and he's doing away with the scriptures. No, he wrote the scriptures. He was saying, this is what I meant from the start. And so he clarifies here, don't think that I've come to abolish the Torah or the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And by fulfilling the, the, the Hebrew scriptures, he meant, one, I'm here to live them out the way they should always be lived. And I alone am fully clean and free of sin and able to demonstrate to you what it means. He was the only human who lived the way humans were designed to live. But also, he meant, I'm going to create a community, my kingdom spreading out through earth, that's now his church. It started with Israel and spread it to all nations. Everybody who follows Jesus is in his kingdom and participating in this kind of lifestyle, fulfilling the, the Torah and the prophets the way it's meant to be lived. Not only that, but he would die and rise to cleanse us so that we would have a new heart to live them fully as the video illustrated so beautifully. That is critical. Um, he said, I'm going to skip ahead to the next slide, anyone who breaks the least of these commands and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Uh, but whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, in that day, in that culture, people would have gasped if he, when he said, your righteousness needs to surpass that of the religious experts. Because they were full-time experts at living out the Torah. But notice that Jesus didn't say here, unless your law keeping, your Torah keeping surpasses, or unless your good doing surpasses that of the Pharisees and teachers of the law. He didn't say that. He said, your righteousness needs to surpass their righteousness. Now, what does that mean? It doesn't have to do with what we do. Oh, do we need a change? Okay. Sorry, everybody. Thank you. Technical difficulty. Check. Okay, I'm back on it. There you go. All right. Is that the right slide? Uh, the next slide, please. Unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and teachers. Righteousness, in both Old and New Testament, is a term of right relationship, right standing in a relationship with someone, especially us as creatures in, in God's image, in right standing with him, in right relationship with our creator, and our, the one who loves us. He said that, that needs to surpass the relationship that the Pharisees and teachers of the law have with Yahweh. Now that will flow out into what you do, but it'll come from a very different motivation. See, the Pharisees, many of the Pharisees and teachers of the law were not doing good things because they loved Yahweh. They were doing it in order to be accepted by Yahweh, and Jesus said you can't do that. Jesus was implying here something that Paul made much clearer in Romans 3, next slide. Um, Paul said, no one will be declared righteous in right standing, in right relationship, in God's eyes, by observing the Torah. But now, a righteousness from God, a gift from God, a right relationship, apart from the Torah, has been made known, to which the Torah and the prophets testified. They were looking forward. They told us this was coming. And we're going to see in a minute where that is. Um, next slide. This righteousness, this right relationship that's a gift from God comes through faith in Jesus, the anointed one, the king, to all who believe. There's no difference for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by the anointed one, Jesus. 
So that righteousness that we're supposed to have that surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law is a right relationship that's given to us and paid for by the sacrifice of Jesus. That's what Jesus was implying when he said, you've got to be righteous. Let's jump ahead to Romans 8. Same letter later on, Paul says, there's now no condemnation for those who are in King Jesus. For what the Torah was powerless to do, in that it was weakened by our sinful nature, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful humanity to be a sin offering. See, the law wasn't bad, it was good. We needed to know, we, we need the guidelines, the wisdom to know how to live healthily with fulfillment, uh, in peace with God and with people. We need to know that. So the Torah is wonderful. It just doesn't have the power in itself to help us live it. We needed that power from someone else. And Jesus came to give us that power. He says uh, in that passage, next slide, so he, uh, God, condemns sin in Jesus' flesh in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the sinful nature, our sinful nature, but according to the spirit. See, part of what makes that possible for us to now, in following Jesus, live the Torah the way it was always meant to is because God came to live in us in his spirit. That was promised in the Hebrew scriptures. We saw about three weeks, uh, two or three weeks ago when we looked at our relationship with God, we looked at Jeremiah 31, where it was promised through the prophet Jeremiah centuries before Jesus came. This is the new covenant I will make with the people of Israel and we all, other nations, were meant always to be brought into this relationship through Israel. This is the new covenant. Fourth line, I will put my Torah in their minds and write it on their hearts. And in the Bible, heart means everything inside you, not just your emotions. I'm going to write it on your inner person. It'll become part of you. I will be their God and they will be my people. Next slide. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, no Yahweh, because they'll all know me from the least to the greatest, declares Yahweh. And then also, next slide, Ezekiel said something very similar with some new insights. He also was talking about the new covenant that Jesus would come and make possible, the new relationship arrangement through Jesus. Yahweh said, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will, be, I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. We've got idols today. Anything that takes God's place in our minds and hearts. <clears throat> I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. See, when you come to a relationship with Jesus, he doesn't just erase your sins and say you're not guilty anymore. He changes you. So there's both forgiveness and rebirth and change. You become different. I will remove from you your heart of stone, hard hearts that resist God, that are, find obedience begrudging, uh, hearts that try to obey a, a command that's written down outside you. I'll give you a heart of flesh, a living heart, something different. Next slide. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Not because those save you. I've already saved you if you've come into a relationship. This is the outflow of being changed by me living in you and giving you this new heart. That's what Torah is meant to do for us. And this is the power by which we can successfully live it for our great fulfillment and pleasure and for the benefit of God and everybody else. That's what it's all about. So <clears throat> we need to understand Torah in a new way. It's not a law code, it's not the authority, it's illustrations of wisdom principles uh, let's go to the next slide. When we enter relationship with God through Jesus, he comes to live in us by his spirit. He writes his Torah on our hearts. Next slide. This is how God gives us a new heart. And it's a heart that desires. If you've come into true relationship with Jesus, at some level you really want to live by his wisdom and will. It desires to love and obey him. And it's now enabled to learn over time with his support, with the support of his people and his spirit living in you, to learn to obey and love him more and more. Uh, you can obey God without loving him, sort of. You can't love God truly without obeying him. It's going to happen.
From the beginning, next slide, God said he wanted Israel and now his church to display to the world his wisdom and his character. He wants people all around us to see what, what he's like in us so that they can see what it's like to be part of his kingdom. That's what this is all about. And it's part of our kingdom series that we've been going on, on through for some time and will continue for a long time to come. It's so critically important. And this is at the heart of how we live our fulfilled purpose to show the world what Yahweh is like and how his wisdom and character work in us. Next slide. That's how the Torah of God's kingdom is meant to operate among us. We who are children of God and sacred citizens of his kingdom. That's what Torah is all about. That's how to understand it, and that's how to find the power to actually fulfill it and live it and want to. It's the greatest way to live. It was the way we were made. And in this time, what better opportunity to show the revolutionary wisdom and love of Yahweh by following, understanding and following his Torah in compassion. The things he said in our Old Testament weren't barbaric. They were revolutionary. They were compassionate and loving. They were the next step toward much of what we understand and enjoy in freedom today. Much of what we take for granted in our freedoms, our assumptions, wouldn't exist if he hadn't introduced Torah 3,000 years ago and started the process this led to today. There's a lot of bad stuff, but there's a lot of amazing good stuff today because he introduced Torah. Now, we've already had this morning's 915 class. Next slide. And it's going to be available in recorded form on both Facebook and YouTube. Unfortunately, YouTube didn't work out very well today and we weren't able to live cast what we're recording and we will put a version of both the 915 class and the sermon on both Facebook and YouTube. Um, if you want more, please go watch the recording of the class that's already happened because my intention through that was to expand more and bring more application and understanding and more of a basis for thinking this way about Torah. So the class is there for that purpose, and you will have that available soon. Thanks so much. Joan. Thank you, Brian. Appreciate that word, great perspective on Torah. Yellowstone back again. I like it. What's that? Oh, we need, no, 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 not that easy. Just the words. There we are. All right, let's try singing together again as we close things out.
Thank you for joining us. Uh, I hope this is encouraging to you. I hope it's especially valuable to you as uh, we deal with what we are right now. I'm so grateful that we sang earlier the song, uh, Blessed Be the Lord, because when my family was going through a very, very dark time, that song spoke to me. And I, even today, have trouble getting through all the words because I break down in gratitude for God's goodness. And he showed his heart and his goodness through the Torah so that we might live in greatest fulfillment and, and be there for him and for others in the way that we were intended to. It's what we were made for. Enjoy your week.